Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is August 8, 2020. And today, uh, rather than an audiobook proper, I have two articles for you on socialism in Laos. This is a topic that doesn't seem to have a ton of information published about it. Um, unlike, you know, the USSR, where a lot of the leading revolutionaries and leaders published their own works and wrote you know, various books on theory and history and whatnot, uh, or China, etc. cetera. Uh, I just really can't find too much on Laos. There are a couple of books that I'm in the process of maybe tracking down that might be relevant. But in the meantime, um, to help put something into that void, I did dig up two articles, recent articles, um, which uh, are not in the public domain, so... If either of the authors of this want me to take it down, I will. Just let me know, um, and I'll do that. But uh, I will credit you and everything, and uh, of course, this will get some more information about socialism in Laos, uh, one of the remaining five countries with Marxist-Leninist leadership um, out there into the world. So this is the first article. It is called Laos Building the Foundations of Socialism. This is an article credited to the editorial staff uh, from 2nd May 2018 at Socialist Voice, which is the media outlet for the Communist Party of Ireland, a Marxist-Leninist party. Okay, so getting into the article, uh, and before I do that, I should po apologize in advance. Both these articles contain Southeast Asian names and place names that I'm going to butcher, so please just, uh, I'm normally pretty good about that where I can be, but I just don't know how to pronounce a lot of this stuff, so. Okay, that said, the Lao People's Democratic Republic is a country of less than 7 million people in Southeast Asia. It has been officially under the leadership of the Lao People's Revolutionary Party since 1975. Article 13 of the country's constitution states that, quote, all types of enterprises are equal before the law and operate according to the principle of the market economy, competing and cooperating with each other to expand production and business while regulated by the state in the direction of socialism, end quote. Laos has the disadvantage of being the most bombed country on earth. During the Vietnam War, the United States dropped more than two and a half million tons of bombs on Laos. This small rural country had 30% more bombs dropped on it than did industrial Germany during the Second World War. The Vietnamese liberation movement made use of parts of Laos that came to be called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, assisted by the revolutionary Pathet Lao movement, while the CIA encouraged ethnic tensions within Laos and financed such groups as the Secret Army led by Vong Pao. Laos has 67 different ethnic communities with the main group, the Lao, making up less than a third of the total population. French colonialism left the country devoid of industry and without even a modest working class or intelligentsia. As a result, the class and national aspects of the anti-imperialist struggle were understood by the People's Revolutionary Party as necessitating a national democratic struggle against imperialism and the feudal structure of society. The first five-year plan did not reach its objectives and economic growth, growth slowed. As a result, in 1986, the state launched the New Economic Mechanism, modeled on the new economic policy in the early years of Soviet Russia. The aim was to attract foreign capital investment while introducing aspects of a market economy into the country. Laos cannot be labeled as socialist, but rather as a socialist state that is building the material basis for socialism. The country still has significant problems, mainly arising from the unexploded bombs dropped on it during the 1960s and 70s. Every year, more than 300 people are killed or injured by the unexploded bombs that still litter the countryside. Only 1% of these bombs have been cleared, which makes about a third of the country's land unsafe for the people trying to earn a living from it. The United States has given some aid towards making the countryside safe from bombs, but nowhere near the amount it costs to actually drop the bombs. The effects of the counter-revolutions in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union forced the country to open up further to penetration by external capital. However, the state still maintains a good deal of control over the market. The system of political economy can be said to be similar in some respects to the people's democracy models in Poland and Hungary, with some modifications to suit much more backwards conditions in Laos. 
Because of this, the Lao economy has never experienced a recession, much unlike the larger capitalist states, and it was spared most of the problems affecting other Asian countries after the Asian financial crisis of 1997. In 1992, the poverty rate stood at 46 percent, but by 2008, this had dropped to 28 percent, showing the success of the state's economic policies. Land is nationalized by law and may not be privately owned. Land management authorities make sure the state has the say in how land is used and by whom. Under the labor law of 2006, all labor units must have an affiliated trade union to represent the workers. The Lao Federation of Trade Unions has nearly 100,000 members. This is impressive when we consider the very small working class in the country, with more than 70% of the population engaged in agriculture. Work is typically for eight hours a day and not more than 48 hours a week, with overtime having to be decided beforehand in consultation with the trade unions. The law makes it difficult for workers to be dismissed, but if they are, the employer must first find them alternative employment. Workers who are pregnant, are undergoing medical treatment, or have given birth less than a year previously cannot be dismissed. Health services are also provided for by the state under the Constitution. Laos is a country with much value for those eager to understand the complexities involved in the building of socialism in very difficult conditions. The priority for the country now is not to nationalize every economic unit in the country, but rather to use foreign capital to develop strategic industries such as mining and hydroelectric power while providing for the people's needs, developing the working class as a force in the country, and allowing the country to build the foundations of socialism. So that is the first article. Again, that is from Socialist Voice from the Communist Party of Ireland. And then the second article on Laos, which is a longer and uh, more in-depth article, comes to us from Liberation School. This is a media project of the Party for Socialism and Liberation in the United States. It's found at liberationschool.org. The title of this article is Mung Lao, A Portrait of the Lao People's Democratic Republic written by Morgan Artukina, excuse me, uh, September 22nd, 2017. And the article starts, The Pathet Lao, antecedent of the Lao People's Revolutionary Party, and the architect of a successful decades-long struggle for socialism, celebrated its 67th anniversary last month. In August 1950, the Laotian section of the Indochinese Communist Party, led by Su Fanavong, formed a separate organization to struggle on behalf of Laotian independence and socialism. The fruit of their struggle is the Lao People's Democratic Republic, a socialist state of 6.7 million people that has persisted through trial and tribulation for 42 years. Like their closely allied Vietnamese neighbors, Laotians too have survived French colonialism, U.S. imperialism, isolation from China, the loss of the Soviet Union, and the ascendancy of neoliberalism. What follows is a short overview of Laotian history, the formation of the Lao People's Democratic Republic in 1975, and the Laotian people's heroic struggle to win and retain their freedom in an increasingly hostile world. From Lan Shang Hom Kao to French Indochina. The territory comprising the modern state of Laos assumed its present form as a result of French imperialism, which ruled the territory from 1889 to 1949 following the collapse of Lanchang Hom Kao, or Kingdom of One Million Elephants and White Parasols. This once prosperous kingdom had long since fractured into client states dominated by the powerful Ratanakosin Kingdom in the southwest, known to outsiders as Siam. In 1862-3, the French Empire annexed neighboring Cambodia and Cochin China and began sending expeditions into the interior of the continent. Following a short war with Siam in 1893, Laos was annexed, and in 1898, all their Southeast Asian colonies were reorganized into French Indochina. The Lao royalty in Luanfabang retained only nominal autonomy. By the early 20th century, the French imperialists realized that their main goal in Southeast Asia, conquering Siam, was not possible. The Ratakonsin Kingdom grew closer to the British Empire after losing the war with France. Consequently, the French viewed Laos as a border region to provide security for the far more valuable Vietnamese territories, and as a hinterland to provide resources for French-controlled Vietnamese industry near the coast. 
the French exploited the country for rice cultivation and rice alcohol production, employing an unpaid corvée labor system. By the 1920s, the French also established a tin mining operation and a coffee plantation, though few French residents settled there. The Formation of Lao National Identity In the early 20th century, resistance to the growth of colonial institutions forged together an active group of anti-colonial intellectuals that played a key role in creating a new Laotian national consciousness. Militant anti-colonial struggles gave form and focus to the drive for Laotian independence, uniting the various non-Lao ethnicities and cultures in the highlands to their east and south in common cause against French imperialism. The French founded several colonial institutions in Vientiane, turning a small regional city into the main administrative and cultural center in the country. Colonial institutions such as the Law School and Independent Lao Buddhist Institute aimed to create an indigenous petty bourgeoisie of civil administrators who would run the country on behalf of the French Empire. This petty bourgeoisie, however, began to form nationalist inspirations of their own and would support the drive for independence championed by the Laotian monarchy during and after World War II, although many of them would favor cooperation with the West over socialist revolution. Onerous taxes and extensive exploitation of Laotian peasants as unpaid laborers provoked strong resentment across the country. Uprisings by the spiritual leader Ang Kiao and his successor Ang Kamendam in the south and by the Mongs in the north frustrated French authorities for decades. Kiao and Kamendam's uprising called the Holy Man's Rebellion forged a united identity for the various hill tribes in the south who Kamendam collectively called the Kam and aimed to reassert the prestige and glory they had enjoy enjoyed during the past Khmer and Lanshang kingdoms. Walking the Tightrope to Independence, World War II A coup d'etat ended 800 years of absolute monarchical rule in the Ratana Kosin kingdom in 1932 and created a constitutional monarchy controlled by Thai ethnic nationalists. Renaming the country Thailand, the Rana Ratsadan People's Party, led by Field Marshal Plaik Fibon Sankram, aimed to unite all Thai peoples, which included the Lao, under a single state. After France was defeated and occupied by Nazi Germany in 1940, the rump state, known as Vichy France, ruled by Field Marshal Philippe Pétain from Vichy, assumed control over the French Empire's colonies and allied itself with Germany. With France occupied by Nazi Germany, the Thai government seized the opportunity to invade and annex several provinces in the Mekong Valley. The Thai allied Japanese mediated the peace treaty with Vichy France, using the crisis as an opportunity to establish their own presence in Southeast Asia. The Laotian, Vietnamese, and Cambodian nationalist groups, including the Lao Nationalist Movement for National Renovation, continued to fight. They forged a greater amount of national unity during the French Popular Front government from 1936 to 38, which allowed both nationalist and communist parties to operate legally and even to form part of government coalitions. But by 1939, all of these groups had been banned. In February 1941, Ho Chi Minh returned from abroad and the Indo-Chinese Communist Party adopted a program of national liberation, forming the League for the Independence of Vietnam, or Vietnam Doc Lap Dong Minh Hoi, or Viet Minh for short, and to fight against both French colonial authorities and Japanese occupiers. Large numbers of Lao freedom fighters joined the ranks of the Viet Minh. On March 9, 1945, the Japanese government, in an effort to save a failing situation, directly seized Indochina from the French, imprisoning colonial authorities and forming the different national governments into a constellation of semi-independent states forcibly incorporated into its greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Although Vietnam was broken up, Cambodia and Laos became independent states until the end of World War II, when they were again seized by the French from the Thai monarchy. The Three Princes Laotian communists in the Indochinese Communist Party fought with the Viet Minh and gained invaluable military and political experience in the 1940s. Although their Free Laos Front, later shortened to Laos Homeland or Pathet Lao, was nominally supportive of the monarchist Free Laos government in exile, in reality it remained closely allied to the Vietnamese communists. Ironically, the leaders of the three forces of the Laotian Civil War were all children of Prince Bon Kong, the last vice king of Luanfabang. Of the three princes, as they are known in Lao history, 
Su Fanuvong is the most famous. He was one of the key leaders and organizers of the Pathet Lao, a close supporter of Ho Chi Minh, and a committed communist. His half-brother Boon Um was a royalist, and their half-brother Suvana Fuma was a western-leaning moderate. Suvanu Fong was the only one of the three who was not of full, quote, noble blood, as his mother came from a peasant family. The Hidden War The historic Vietnamese victory at Dien Bien Phu in 1954 ousted the French. Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos had won their independence. The U.S. intervened to carve the South Vietnamese puppet state out of these three self-determining countries. The so-called domino theory asserted that socialist states encouraged revolutions in neighboring countries. This motivated the U.S. to develop much closer ties with the Thai government and to become more involved in fighting communism in Southeast Asia. Although the American support for South Vietnam in its war against the North and the civil war against the National Liberation Front was well publicized, by comparison their growing interest in Laos was repeatedly denied and kept out of the media, resulting in its nickname, the Hidden War. Early in the war, American intelligence considered deploying 60,000 troops to southern Laos to support their side of the conflict, even weighing the option of using nuclear weapons. The CIA spent $500 million training and arming tens of thousands of Hmongs on behalf of the royal Lao government as the communist insurgency in the north and east grew, it is the largest paramilitary operation the CIA has ever undertaken. Laos was key to the Vietnamese resistance war against America, allowing the Army of North Vietnam to ship soldiers and supplies through the eastern side of its territory along what became known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In addition to their direct involvement in the expanding Laotian Civil War, the Americans waged several bombing campaigns against the Ho Chi Minh Trail, including Operations Barrel Roll, Steel Tiger, and Commando Hunt. Between 1964 and 1973, the U.S. flew 580,000 bombing missions and dropped 2 million tons of bombs on Laos. That is more bombs than were dropped during all of World War II. Over 500,000 people died in the Laotian Civil War. This had a massive impact on a small country of only 3.5 million people, and they continue to die today. Another 20,000 people have been killed since the war ended by stepping on U.S. bombs left over from the war that never exploded. In September 2016, then-U.S. President Barack Obama pledged $90 million to help Laos find and disarm the estimated 80 million cluster bombs that never exploded. Although he claimed a, quote, obligation to help Laos, Obama stopped short of apologizing for U.S. crimes there. Much of the large-scale poppy cultivation in the region stems from the Civil War era as well. The CIA was one party that trafficked opioid narcotics to support the communities that it was arming to fight the communists, particularly the Hmongs. Major problems with drug smuggling away from populated areas still frustrate the central government, and these are likely to continue while Myanmar, and to a lesser extent Thailand, remain unable to stem the lucrative poppy cultivation and narcotics trades. Pathet Lao victorious. When the Vietnamese defeated the U.S. in April of 1975, it forced the U.S. out of the entire region. U.S. support for the Laotian monarchy dwindled. The Pathet Lao seized power in December of 1975, seven months after their Vietnamese counterparts. The country was renamed the Lao People's Democratic Republic, or Lao PDR, and the Pathet Lao was reorganized as the Lao People's Revolutionary Party. Su Fanuvong was president of the republic, but was not as active in the Pathet Lao leadership. He retired in 1991 to become an elder statesman until his death in 1995. The Laotian communists enjoyed the support of a variety of national front organizations representing the different ethnic minorities in Laos. Once the war was over, new problems reared their head. Laos had almost no industry upon which to base an expansion of productive forces. The formation of socialist relations of production in the country primarily took the form of nationalization, the collectivization of agriculture, and a state monopoly on foreign trade. Political relations with its neighboring countries made economic growth difficult. And as a result of the porous border with Thailand, a prolific black market emerged in Thailand where Laotian farmers could sell their goods. This frustrated the government's efforts to control capitalist accumulation in the country and to achieve self-sufficiency. Building Socialism in Lao PDR 
1976, the military once more seized power in Thailand, closing the border but also stepping up Thai support for terrorist forces in Laos who were attacking collectivized farms, sabotaging production, and assassinating communist officials. At the same time, the deteriorating relations between Vietnam and Cambodia affected Laos. The socialist government of Vietnam was forced to enter into Cambodia to halt the Khmer Rouge's massacring of Khmer and Vietnamese civilians. Disastrously, China sided with the sanguinary Khmer Rouge, and in a major blow to the unity of socialist states, China invaded Vietnam, destroying Hanoi, a city just beginning to recover from 13 years of U.S. bombing. The breakdown of principled international relations left Laos with few friends. By the end of the decade, they were forced to back off from aggressive socialist reforms and instead permit a partial return of market relations. Although many peasants left collective farms in the 1980s and their land returned to individual management, the state still owns that land and leases it to Lao citizens for as long as 30 years or to foreign investors for up to 50 years. However, even today, 37% of farmland remains unsafe because of undetonated munitions from the war. In a country where 70% of the population is engaged in subsistence or near subsistence agriculture, this is an enormous drain on Laos' economic potential. In 1977, Vietnam and Laos signed a 25-year treaty of friendship, and Vietnamese advisors provided much-needed expertise in government and economic policies. Vietnam and Laos fit together, as the common saying goes, like lips and teeth. Laos grew closer to Vietnam as its primary trade partner and only route to the sea. The Soviet Union provided most foreign aid to Laos, and especially the Laotian armed forces. In 1981, the first five-year plan aimed for self-sufficiency, but the perceived slow economic growth of roughly 5% per year was judged insufficient, and the second five-year plan from 1986 to 1990 implemented the New Economic Mechanism, or NEM, which aimed to slowly integrate parts of the Laotian economy with the world economy without sacrificing its food self-sufficiency. While the capitalist world has remained largely uninterested in Laos, China, Vietnam, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea have been the primary investors. By the end of the second five-year plan, rice production had doubled and sugar production had increased by 40%. Since 1990, Laos cut the number of people living in poverty in half while the population has nearly doubled. Despite these advances, Lao PDR remains an oppressed country seeking to overcome its tortured recent past. The Future of Lao PDR in recent years, the Laotian government focused on the extraction industries, opening new tin and potash mines with the help of China and the DPRK, and gold, silver, and copper mines in partnership with other investors, particularly in Australia. The mining sector only comprises around 7% of the Laotian economy, with the industrial sector contributing 28.6%. Hydroelectric power constitutes an enormous part of the Laotian economy, forming 30% of its exports in 2017. Heavy government investment in that industry began in 1993 and rapidly expanded due to the low population density of the country and the comparative ease with which new dams could be constructed. With Lao PDR already producing far more electricity than it needs, it is poised to become a major supplier of clean electricity to all of Southeast Asia. Another area of economic growth in recent years has been rubber plantations, most of them in the north near the Chinese border. The area under rubber cultivation is projected to reach 13.8 million hectares by 2018, and much of this growth comes from the demand for tires by the rapidly expanding automobile industry in China. Many of these plantations are funded by foreign investors, but local villages struggle to exert some communal control over the plantations, as is laid out by law. Lao PDR retains very strict labor rules that reflect the power of its working class. Labor unions exist alongside party and council bodies, and all labor units must have a trade union representative. Workers are protect protected by these institutions from being fired, and any layoff must be justified in a court. Such justifications must prove that the employer already has sought new employment for the worker, with the employer being paid a termination allowance to support them while they continue to look for new work. Employment is a task the government and labor unions also help with. Labor is restricted to 8 hours a day or 48 hours a week for all trades, with maximum overtime hour limits also set, and with extremely generous paid sick leave, maternity leave, and vacation time. 
Despite these protections, the presence of market relations ensures the continued survival of a bourgeoisie in Lao PDR. Under socialism, the class struggle continues, but it assumes new forms. The power of the bourgeoisie rests mainly in control over local markets and trade in the highly decentralized country. However, the control by the Laotian working classes over the commanding heights of the economy and the strict limits on private property keep the Laotian bourgeoisie on a tight leash. The future of socialism and the Lao PDR are closely tied to the fates of their socialist neighbors. A growing relationship with China and new trade opportunities with surrounding Southeast Asian nations promises economic growth. When we speak of economic growth and capital accumulation, we should never forget to ask the question posed by Lenin, for whom or for which class? So uh, thanks again, major thanks to Morgan Artukina, September 22, 2017, writing that article again titled Mung Lao, A Portrait of the Lao People's Democratic Republic, published by the Party for Socialism and Liberation at liberationschool.org. That article, and end of article, these are my comments again, Socialism for All, uh, that article was by far, far and away, the most informative thing that I could find about the history of uh, socialism uh, in Laos. So there you have it. Um, hopefully everyone walks away from this video a little bit uh, clearer on what's going on in Laos. Again, it's a poor country, bombed into oblivion, uh, much like North Korea, um, and then struggling to, you know, rebuild uh, in a way that leans towards socialism while acknowledging it's a rural peasant economy and they're trying to do what they can with many hostile enemies uh, afoot and lurking about. So this has been Socialism for All. Socialism for All can be found on YouTube at youtube.com slash C slash Socialism for All on Facebook at facebook.com slash Socialism for All and on Patreon at patreon.com slash Socialism for All. Thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen right now. We're up to three. That's awesome. I really appreciate uh, that support. Um, the money helps me to buy books and just, you know, more comfortably spend the large amount of time that is required to do this. And it's also just very encouraging. Uh, beyond. So you can support us for as little as a dollar a month or as much as a hundred dollars a month with uh, five, 10, 20 and other denominations in between. So again, thanks for listening. Please like and share. We'll see you next time.